Good afternoon. Welcome to the Hood Museum of Art. I'm Juliet Bianco, Deputy Director. We are honored tonight to be joined by two brilliant and wonderful artists, Jay and Wadsworth Jarrell, and to learn from them about their philosophy, their art, and the founding and trajectory of the Chicago Art Collaborative at the Cobra. Two works by Jay Jarrell are featured in the magnificent Brooklyn Museum organized exhibition that we are fortunate to host at Dartmouth this fall, Witness Art and Civil Rights in the 60s. If you have not yet seen the exhibition, or even if you have, we invite you upstairs after this event for refreshments and to view the galleries. The museum is open until nine o'clock tonight. I'm pleased now to introduce the host of tonight's conversation, who will in turn introduce Jay and Wadsworth Jarrell, and then lead the discussion, leaving time for questions at the end. Rebecca Zorak is professor of art history, romance languages, and the college at the University of Chicago and senior chair of the University Society of Fellows in the Liberal Arts. She received her doctorate, doctorate in art history in 1999 from the University of Chicago, and her distinguished career since then has included numerous grants, fellowships, and honors, including most recently a Terra Foundation exhibition grant in support of the 19, oh no, not, oh, 2013 exhibition Afrocobra in Chicago, and an Andrew W. Mellon Residential Fellowship for Never the Same, a collaborative interview and archiving project on socially and politically engaged art in Chicago. She has no fewer than four books in progress at the moment, including Street Teachings, Community, Public Experiment, and the Black Arts Movement in Chicago, under contract with Duke University Press, and Art Against the Law with the University of Chicago Press. Her publications already in print range from such topics as the Christian Trinity in early modern Europe and abundance and excess in the French Renaissance and the provocatively titled article Fireplug Flower Baboon, the Democratic Thing in the late, in the late 1960s Chicago. So you can see we are in excellent hands for tonight's conversation. Thank you so much for being here, Rebecca, Wadsworth, and Jay. Thank you, Juliet. Um, I'm, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and a wonderful privilege to um, be able to introduce Jay and Wadsworth Carroll and to talk with them, um, open up this discussion with a few questions. Um, and I look forward to hearing from them the, the um, comments they're going to make on their work um, and also to answer question, any questions that you may have um, about it, about, about their careers and about their, um, their work. I've, which I've admired for a long time, um, and I ha had the pleasure to, um, the opportunity to meet with them and interview them, I think four years ago now, in Cleveland at their home and studio, um, for uh, the, the uh, Never the Same interviewing project that Juliet mentioned. Um, and soon after that, I also brought a group of students to, to visit with them, um, and we had a, a wonderful experience learning from them about their work um, and discussing the, the the period of the late 1960s in Chicago that was the, um, the, um, the this really generative moment for um, for so many artists, but but in particular for Afrocobra, um, the African commune of bad relevant bad relevant artists, which they co-founded um, with three other artists in Chicago, um, uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about that as I introduce them. Um, finally, I had the distinct pleasure of working with them on the Afrocobra in Chicago exhibition, um, which occurred at three different Southside Chicago institutions last summer. Um, and so it's just it's just a real pleasure to, to be here at Dartmouth with them. Um, so I will introduce them um, alphabetically by first name. <laughs> um, Jay Gerald designs clothing inspired by the beauty of black and African art and culture. She studied at Bowling, Bowling Green State University in Ohio and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, later er earning her BFA from Howard University in Washington, DC. She pursued graduate studies at Howard and at Parsons School of Design in New York. A founding member of Afrocobra, along with Wadsworth, Gerald, um, Jeff Donaldson, Barbara Jones Hogu, and Gerald Williams, she exhibited her work with the collective in Chicago and also around the United States in the Afrocobra 1, 2, and 3 exhibitions. She served as the director of the fashion show for the Creative Modern Black and African Dressing Committee 
at the second international Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture, abbreviated as uh, FESTAC, or with the acronym FESTAC, in 1977. I think that was in Lagos, Nigeria? That's right, okay. Um, Gerald owned and operated several businesses, including Jay's of Hyde Park, a clothing boutique on Chicago's South Side, Say Cheese Bakery in Atlanta, Georgia, and J. Gerald Vintage Menswear and Collectibles in New York City. While living in Georgia with her husband Wadsworth, she began Tadpole Industries, designing wooden educational toys marketed to early childhood centers. Taking a part-time position teaching art in middle school at Athens Academy, where the ch their children were enrolled, allowed Jay to share work hours with Wadsworth in their new retail venture, Tadpole Toys and Hobby Center. 1984, she accepted a full-time position teaching art at the Lovett School in Atlanta, affecting the family's move and the children's transfer to the new school, from which she retired in 1990. Her work has been exhibited widely, both nationally and internationally, and her remarkable ebony family and urban wall suit are exhibited upstairs in witness and really beautifully installed, I think. Wadsworth Gerald is a painter and sculptor, and also photographer, I think, yeah? Yeah. Um, in his long career as an artist, he's been committed to making works dedicated to a black aesthetic and Afrocentric forms and themes. Gerald moved to Chicago in 1953 and studied fine and commercial art, earning a four-year diploma from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and later an MFA from Howard University in Washington. He joined the Organization of Black American Culture Obasi in 1967 and painted the rhythm and blues section on the Wall of Respect, a landmark mural painted in 1967 on Chicago's South Side um, by Obasi artists. A founding member of Afrocobra, um, Gerald's studio, WJ Studio and Gallery, which he shared with Jay, was host to numerous performances of Chicago musicians and poets, art exhibitions, and early Afrocobra meetings. Among his works are colorful portraits of key figures in the black liberation movement of the late 1960s with embedded messages of self-determination and black consciousness. Gerald exhibited with Afrocobra throughout the United States and also at Festac in 1977. He held teaching positions at Howard University, the University of Georgia, and at the University of Georgia's Study Abroad program in Cortona, Italy. He's the recipient of numerous awards and his work has been exhibited widely in the US and abroad. Together, Jay and Wadsworth Gerald have shared a familial and artistic partnership that has spanned many decades. Tonight, I'll be posing a few initial questions to them, then opening up discussion to the audience. I'd like to ask them to speak to their work as individual artists, as artists in a profoundly creative partnership in which ideas both cross-pollinated between them and also grew in parallel and divergent paths, and as two artists who shared the collective experience of a broader group of artists with shared concerns forging a distinctive black aesthetic and philosophy. So first what I'd like to do is to ask you to speak to that philosophy, which I think is one of the really, um, truly unique aspects of Afrocobra, not only as a group of black artists, but also as a group of artists, the fact that you developed, that you together developed a philosophy. So I'd like to ask how it developed and also how the philosophy manifests itself differently or similarly in both of your work. And we can we have some images to show, and we can we can discuss the the the, you know, the, the questions that I'll be asking with respect to the images or or on their own terms. I am so glad that uh, you're here with us um, to share our celebration of this um, wonderful exhibition. Uh, and thanks to the hood for that, and that I'd like for you to know the beauty we found in Africobra. Uh, it has been uh, a very dynamic thing in our lives, and it's because we chose to do things together with other artists and create a philosophy and uh, let it guide us in our work to enlighten our people and our communities. And so I appreciate um, being able to share that with you today, and you'll hear of more of our philosophy. Um, 
five of us joined together in 1968 in Chicago, Illinois. It was in the studio of Jay and myself, my, our studio, and we also lived there. And we joined together to explore the possibility of creating a new language um, in art. Um, and we all had training in Western procedures in art. So we wanted to create another way of thinking, and this was all European education we had. All of us had uh, European education in art aesthetics of European. So we wanted to find another way to come up with a new language that would actually would coincide with the 1960s, what was really going on with the Black Arts Movement. <clears throat> and we came together as Coalition of Black Revolutionary Artists was the name. First thing we did was name ourselves. And after that, we created a philosophy made up of principles, of 12 principles, or about 12. And some of the principles were, one, the first one was Kool-Aid Colors, which was a parody probably of the color, the product Kool-Aid, but the, the name really emanated from the clothing that the black communities were wearing all over America, it was bright clothing, and they coined it Kool-Aid Colors. So we spelled it, spelled it different than the product. Uh, of course, we were liable if you use the product's name in the first place. So we call it, spell it C-O-O-L-A-D-E uh, colors. So, and uh, that was our first principle. The one was frontal images, which was indicative of African art, African sculpture, which is all frontal. It's never three quarters of the profile. And this gave the image strength. Um, and we'll see that in some of the other, um, some of the other, we'll, we'll see that in many of the images that we see, but it's, it's, it's certainly um, visible, as, as are the Kool-Aid colors in Boss Couple, the, the painting that's up on the screen. Yes, yes. And um, those of, we had several principles. I'm not going to go into all of them, but those are very visible. You will see the colors, when I say Kool-Aid colors, you will see this visible in everyone's work. And normally the frontal images you will see also. And uh, we was, our ultimate goal was to create a school of thought, which in the end we declared that we had. <laughs> well, maybe we can look at, um at the urban wall suit, because that, I mean, this certainly dis also displays the Kool-Aid colors. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that's clear from both, of, both the painting and the suit is the use of text in your work. Is it, could, would you like to speak about that? Jill? Right. That is particularly one of our principles, uh, was to write on our surfaces uh, so that um, we could s celebrate through statements, uh, bring attention to awareness of issues that we uh, wanted to stress. Um, it was also a part of, um, of, of a principle that we thought of as poster art um, that you may drive by and glance at a billboard and get the message, um, and so um, we incorporated that in so that we sort of drew away from some of the Western traditions that we had learned in, in our, our training um, to bring this to an urban kind of black community kind of um, emphasis, um, and so that we could say what we meant in our work and did not allow ourselves to be um, defined by um, the critics or the powers that be. And, and this piece in particular has, it, it's, I mean, that's in some ways 
the, the directness of graffiti, right? That, right. That um, this piece is urban wall suit that um, I was inspired by the walls of the community. Um, they served as a bulletin board uh, for the neighborhood where people made statements um, and sometimes answered one another on, on the board. Um, and it, it was um, phenomenal to me to see that people were communicating through walls. And um, it happened to be um, a total inspiration once I was patchworking some fabric. It's, I have to tell you the truth, I didn't start off there. Um, the patchwork gave me a real incentive when I saw a wall that had been uh, gra graffitied and, um, and then some just simple messaging and I decided to transfer that. That was, to me, a very emphatic thing that measured this time and period um, when people felt strong enough to be the voice in their community. Make a statement, answer a statement, give the news of the day or the, the, or the period. And um, it had a language of its own. And I, I thought that this was something that I would like to address in Africa. Maybe we can look at compared to what? Compared to, okay. This, uh, we started off with assignments. We had two assignments in the beginning that everyone made a piece of art uh, recognizing that assignment. This was the second assignment we had. Um, this is called compared to what? And it, the idea was to compare an African American to someone white. Uh, in this case, I chose a musician, a blues musician. Uh, and the people in the background are the images of the Beatles. So I compared the blues musician to the Beatles. And I, comp and I compared him superior because black people created the blues. And, and rock and roll is really birthed out of the blues. It's really directly birthed out of the blues with an up-tempo. Um, and the way I work painted it, it um, images I'm using, I'm still looking I haven't really defined the technique I want to work with. Uh, the beginning painting was the same way. The be beginning painting you saw was a portrait of me and my, my son and I. Um, I'm working with B's, the letter B. Uh, the term black is beautiful was very prevalent at that time. So the B is black and beautiful. That's what it was for. And uh, here I'm stylizing the letter B a lot, so you'll see in the painting. I'm still looking for a way I want to say this. This is just developing yet. Maybe I'll move. Since, you, since you mentioned assignments, maybe I'll move to actually the first assignment, which was the black family. Mm -hmm. um, and just to ask you both to speak a little bit about the, the importance of the family, because I think it was something that was important to the two of you as a, as a family and as your family grew. And um, and you have you have three children, yes. correct? Yes. Um, so one boy and two girls, right? Um, and um, the so the, the the family was important to you as a family, and it, I think it was an important concept for the group. Um, many of the members had had children, and there there were children running around in some of your meetings. I think you, mm -hmm. you mentioned and and um, it, but it was also important as a kind of political statement on behalf of the black, the idea of the black family. Um, so I'd love to just have you speak a little bit about how, how, how that came about, how the assignment that, that had each of you doing a piece on the theme of the black family, how that came about and how it informed your work individually and as a group. Mm -hmm. um, black family, um, First of all, I think you need to know that for almost uh, a year, a year and a half, we 
well, a year. We um, met regularly, honed out ideas, tossed them around, just talked uh, politics, talked um, conditions, uh, revolution, all kinds of things we talked about. And you know, before we started our first project, and at some point we decided, well, we prophesied uh, uh, enough that um, we needed to um, do a, a piece in order to bring out some of these principles and ideas. And um, as the first piece, we decided it to be a black family. And the, um, the, it was really nice to, to have a family around. You know, there, there was a young child tod toddling around when um, some of the other members, that, that was our son, and some of the other members might bring their daughter, or, or um, and there was another son around a uh, child's age. But we had seen occasionally people bring their child by, and it became very family-like in, in that uh, essence. And so when we, it, and of course the Kerner Report came out where it might have given you all the incentive in the world to do the black family um, as a power issue uh, to address um, for our urban communities, uh, for our people, um, to really say that this was of import. Um, by our meeting together that regularly, it tended to be like family meetings. Um, this was Africa's first assignment. Everyone did a black family, all five founding members. And um, again, in my work, I'm still working with the letter B. Um, uh, we all, you know, we when we when we met for two years before we ever had an exhibit, except for a couple of local exhibits. We didn't have a major exhibit to, to 1970. We started in 1968, so we met and brainstormed, and you know, our studios were the headquarters, so people would come over. And it would be all day Sunday thing. It might last five or six hours, uh, sometimes longer. And uh, that's the, this was the first assignment we came up with was the black family. So mine is all again is I'm still beginning to develop uh, a way I want to say say what I want to say. We're going to have the house lights down. I think these works in particular might um, be. Yeah. And some of the others, I think the color is more vibrant. Yeah. Um, and so this one, um, Jay, this is not necessarily about a specific family or about about your family or um, but it but I think it, it relates to kind of broader notions of community and and, and the, 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 the broader African American community as a family mm -hmm. uh, yes uh, many uh, many African Americans speak fondly of um, regions that they lived in where the family is extended um, it practices by the neighbor next door, knows the kids and, and speaks with the kids, helps to uh, manage them, uh, looks out for them. Um, this is extended family like so many of us experience in urban communities and in rural communities. Um, but the, um, the beauty of neighbors taking on parent-like uh, posture with your young ones made you a, a feel a sense of safety um, in, and it, that your children could really enjoy their whole community. 
Um, one of the things that I thought was of, of import is to um, to portray the whole family, you know, mother, father, child being embraced and protected, so that that's the the um, vision that our young youngsters could carry and perhaps uh, emanate to. So. It's, it's about um, it's about so brothers surrounding sis is about up, kind of up, uplifting women. Yeah, um, brothers surrounding sis are sort of an outgrowth of, of experiences that I had. Um, I had three big brothers who always looked out for me, and I thought that was a very fond memory that would would read well in you know, what um, what we portray. Um, but by the same token. While we were having these urban concerns and trying to be models for the community, um, there was a period where uh, people began to call you sister when it was not a relative and even possibly a stranger. And I just envisioned that those brothers that were standing up to protect and to uh, respect uh, the sisters in the community. I just thought that was a beautiful thing to um, record. And so that's why I use the interlinked brothers, the arms interlinked around the sister. Yeah. And the sister would be the one wearing the dress. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> yes <right. laughs> So this and this is also the three three queens, also an image of black women. Yeah, this this is uh, a painting that's extolling black women, and it's it's about afros for one thing, about wearing your hair natural, and and at this time before the sixties. Um, Afros was not necessarily in. I, I've seen people with them in the 1950s, but people were still getting their hair, going to the beauty parlor, getting their hair done. So this painting is talking about growing your hair natural and not going to the beauty parlor and not using the makeup, the commercial makeup. And here I have developed the technique that I wanted, a, a way to say what I wanted to say. I'm still using the bees, but I have designed the figures out of the bees and out of words, which, which is the words written as, you know, that's one of our principles, written, written uh, writing directly on the art. And this is one painting is my words. These are all my words. A lot of my paintings are uh, excerpts from speeches of someone else, you know, but this one is all my words, so, and I'm saying stop buying commercial uh, cosmetics, but you're beautiful as, just as you are, you know. Is that a, simi is that a similar message in, the, in this oh, piece? It surely is. Um, I've asked um, our women to adorn, to reflect their um, heritage and um, to embrace the beauty of their natural beauty. Um, and it, it was kind of interesting at the time that I did these pieces, um, because, uh, this piece, because um, I was without my sewing machine and I was up in Boston uh, in between moving from Chicago to DC. Don't ask me why we were in Boston, but nonetheless, <laughs> we were there for a summer <laughs> until that job that Wadsworth received at Howard University opened. So while our things were in storage at that period, um, I had no sewing machine, but I had a show to prepare for. So I went out and bought burlap and felt, and so I did my next pieces for Afro Cobra 
out of burlap or felt. And so this is burlap that when I wanted to seam together the side seams, I cornrowed the, the uh, fibers to make braids um, and to join the garment uh, up the side seams. Um, and fringed whatever else was left, uh, all edges, and uh, hand painted the the um, burlap to, with the images of the sisters uh, that I was trying to influence. So I think we want to we want to open up the conversation to the audience soon. But before we do that, I just I want to make sure to get to to this point, this wonderful comparison of Jay's revolutionary suit and um, and revolutionary, in which Angela Davis is wearing um, that revolutionary suit. Um, and um, and just to just to ask you maybe to to I mean with with this with these um, works in mind, but also in a more general sense, to kind of reflect on. The meaning of revolution for for the two of you and for the group at the time, and how it how it affected the kind of work that you were producing and the thinking of the of, of Africobra. Mm -hmm. uh, addressing the issues that we were, um, all the things that we talked about that we thought we could put um, a more beautiful adventure for our people uh, through art. Um, s still giving some degree of uh, awareness of what is happening, but in a more positive note, the answer to how it should be. And so um, we give you a point of direction. And um, at some point, I, w with my background in suits and coats as a designer, uh, tweed being one of the more s stable Western kind of training that I had had to mm -hmm. and, and appreciated, um, I thought it might be attention getting to do a really fine salt and pepper tweed suit and embellish it with a bandolier. Um, so this was a sort of really wake up call that the women must join the, the, um, the fight. And so that's where I am with that. Um, my, my painting is a painting called Revolutionaries of Angela Davis. Uh, started in 1971 at the time she was incarcerated. It's right after the shootout in uh, California. Um, and this was the first painting that I developed the use of the bees I was using and to model the image with, with uh, letters. Um, this painting in the next three, the next two you will see, this one Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, I was commissioned to do by an educator in Chicago. And they was all from photographs. Um, this was from the famous Life magazine photograph. And I can't remember where Martin Luther King was from, but Malcolm was from a, a regular photograph. You, if you see any of his literature, you'll see this photograph. And I put, use Jay's, uh, of course, her replica of a suit, which put right on Angela. And, and I also use, she has wooden, has a bandolier of wooden um, bullets, bullets that's painted. And I did the same thing on the painting. It's a leather bandolier of wooden bullets that's painted. And that's the correlation. And were you thinking of your work itself as revolutionary, or were you thinking of your artwork as a kind of support and, and illustration of revolution? Or how, how did you think about it in those, in those years? <laughs> we thought we were revolutionaries. <laughs> we thought we were revolutionaries. And, and, <laughs> and, in a sense of, in a sense of art wise, not in a sense of uh, like the Black Panthers or somebody. 
that we had another agenda. Our agenda was with us, mm -hmm. You know, everything we did would be with us for the Black Arts Movement. You know, we didn't sit in March because we were the kind of people you didn't blow smoke in their face or hit over the head or you want to get return punches. So we didn't. <laughs> we were not, we were not that temperament. We couldn't. Really. So that, that's why we considered ourselves revolutionary. That's one reason. You know. But it was all with our art. So the revolutionary energies that, that would have led to fighting back in those yeah. situations instead were invested in your we, art. We fought with paint yeah. and, and, yeah. and other, other materials. Yeah. Also, um, we decided to, as one of the principles, to unlearn a lot of the principal uh, concepts that we were taught. Um, and we deliberately reversed some manners that we might have taken with our work. For instance, um, in, we dealt with light change, just as you see this light basically light up one side more so than the other. If you see Afrocopra images, you might see that that is reversed, just, just being deliberately against um, the principled kinds of sense of lighting. And what was, it, I would imagine that in most instances, it was never quite noticed that we tossed the light elsewhere, wherever we wanted to, perhaps what we wanted to enlighten. But um, the interesting thing, too, is when we were in Chicago, uh, for the philosophy show, and Carolyn Lawrence, one of our painters, um, was looking at her work and she says, I, I don't know why I did that. That light's all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I said, honey, it's been 45 years. You know, we settled. <laughs> you know? But it was just funny. She, was, you know, she really was looking at at one of her paintings, and, and she must have really adhered to the principle. Um, and there, there, I think, um, for the most part, we changed manners in which we did things, just deliberately, in order to teach ourselves a new way to approach. Uh, and so that, that you know that was something that we were invested in, and you'll see that in many of our works. And we also sort of changed the rules of procedure. Um, we only showed would exhibit in African American galleries and venues, or the ones that was controlled by African Americans. And we also charged a fee for showing, not a fee to get in to see the show, just the people who just say this, if, it, if we had a show that came here to the Hood Museum, they would have to pay us a fee to, to get the show, and which was revolutionary for artists also, because most artists, a lot of artists were paid to show. Maybe we can we can open up questions to the audience at yes. this point and um, maybe get the lights up so that we can yeah yeah. Okay. Uh, you made oh. reference a couple of times to uh, uh, some common assignments that the founding members of Afro Cobra undertook. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could tell more about what that was all about. Who made the assignments? Uh, how long did the founding members? Followed through with these common assignments. What was the purpose? Um, yes, the whole group decided on the assignments, and we only made two, two assignments. And after the second one, um, the painting I had compared to what, what we was comparing African Americans to well, Euro Americans, we decided that we would not do make any more assignments we would, everybody just come up with the idea they want to. And we would bring the work in, unfinished, for everyone to critique, which is also unusual 
was, uh, visual art is a very ego-driven, and and for your peers to criticize your work is unusual. Unless you're a student, then you more or less have to accept that. But artists don't normally let their peers see unfinished work and talk about it. But after two assignments, we decided not to do any more. There's a question. I, oh, excuse me. I would just add that the, the stopping the assignments in two, uh, we just simply needed to jump start. Uh, we had philosophized enough, and we sort of needed to get something on, you know, in actuality. And then you find that 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 can be kind of hard um, and not inventive enough to have a project. So at some point right afterwards, the second one, um, we moved on our own and were very, very um, productive. Yeah, my question is, uh, to what extent were you in the Afro cover while you um, engaged with brother black issues elsewhere? And to what degree were issues elsewhere filtered through in, in your work? Jeff introduced us to Pan-Africanism. Uh, there were a number of things that, that he explored because he was working on his doctorate um, and uh, on African art. And so he tended to explore more that he shared with us at our meetings. And we tended to know of activist groups uh, from time to time, um, if that was, if they, if there was, there were events in their country um, that might be shared, the principles that they re received out of, out of their protest or whatever, um, that, and he kept us somewhat abreast of things that he had explored, um, as did other members from some um, ventures that were occurring in other um, areas of the United States. Um, and they would bone up on it and bring the in information in. But it tended to make us uh, some, somewhat in influenced by um, what has occurred elsewhere and align ourselves um, with some reflection of that in our work. Uh, also, uh, Jeff Donaldson, he, he was the scholar in the group, and he had, he was the only person who had visited the continent. Um, matter of fact, he knew Idi Amin personally. He, you know, he had pictures of him on his boat riding with him, and he knows several people, Diop, and several people he knew that we didn't know, you know. So he was a heavy influence on the uh, African part, introducing us to the African part of the group. And later we visited Africa, so, and then it opened up more uh, information for, for the whole group. And, and even later you also had an, another from Soweto, right? On, on the um, so we too. Soweto. Oh, yeah. So we yeah. too. Right? Yeah, yeah. We did a tribute to South Africa. Uh, we decided that we wanted to address other people was experiencing, people that looked like us, was experiencing the same kind of condition we were, like South Africa had apartheid. And we was invited to the UN building when it started um, to an exhibit. Now, we did this before that, didn't we? Yes. Uh, well, anyway, we were invited there at an apartheid <coughs> Um, conference, and we had exhibit uh, hanging around the wall there, and uh, so we did a painting called Soweto, and uh, we call it So We Too. You know. So it was a tribute, uh, like um, you know, um, your 
Ça s'en fait un peu plus loin. That was the most cohesive bunch of folks you ever saw, uh, full of egos and all in one room. <laughs> you talk about family. That's how we honed a family spirit in that organization. It just, it, it was like brothers and sisters. And, you know, it was interesting too. Someone said something about the exhibit in Chicago, you know, Rebecca set up, and um, in the philosophy, I think it might have been in a discussion then, asked about how was it for women in a group that was predominantly men, or at some point, you know, there were more members and there were three of us women, and it never occurred to us any strife whatsoever in being respected and uh, celebrated. And I think uh, Barbara Jones O'Goo answered this um, in the most effective way, and she said, Jeff Donaldson invited each of us. <laughs> and, you know, Jeff, you got to know Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> he picks and he chooses. You know. And if, if you were sanctioned by... By Jeff, you're in, you know, because it means you're bringing something to the table. And it was total respect. Everything that we did, there, was never, there wasn't the women's movement and stuff yet. <laughs> and I guess we caught them off guard, you know. But <laughs> you probably, it's probably, I was talking to her just today, it probably was the only art movement with women that was equal because I have, they had Wayusi in New York and they had one woman in it. And she wrote a long article about how she was not treated equally. She was, her decision was almost ignored. So she left the group and they, she formed a group for women called Where We At. But they was just like anyone else, you know. I mean, this was never, thought about as them being women, you know, uh, it was artists, you know, so, and, uh, I, I'm sorry. That, that's it. <laughs> it was just, I think it's remarkable for that time that, you know, it, it just, it was just an, in the natural course of things that it was a group that included a, a, a pretty large number of women. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but we, we was all a yeah. sort of established artists, you know, we was not beginners, we was, we was all in our 30s and 40s, maybe, mm -hmm. some of us. So we was established in terms of showing in galleries, and some of us mainstream galleries, because I was showing downtown and uh, on Upper Michigan and, and Chicago, and Jeff was showing around. She had her own shop showing. So, and you know, we had to lay egos aside for one thing. This is the first thing we had. And all artists got big egos, you know. <laughs> Every artist thinks he's the best artist in the world. He might not say that to you, but he thinks it. Just a comment and a question. I really like the family. I haven't seen the revolution in the city. I've seen the And if you would confirm the Daniel Lear is also a quote from the famous book, a famous photograph. But who you can do and then I know you've, you've done a painting of um, Newton and Steele at the Cathedral of Seas. And I'm just wondering if there are any paintings, using photographs. Oh, you did? Oh, I just left the door. Are we going to go through this? Oh, sure. I don't, well, we, didn't, we, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't get to all of the ones that we had. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
I, I didn't directly with with Fred uh, about Fred Hampton, uh, but there is a piece uh, Free Brave Young Black. Um, that I I was um, I was really concerned. Um, at, this was a, a a very heavy point when I was in Boston, because we did something um, really revolutionary there with ourselves and our family. Um, when we took the apartment, we didn't bother to buy any furniture because the furniture was in storage on its way to to um, D.C. and that's where I told you that I had no sewing machine and we had a card table and uh, folding chairs for the, the actually some of those apartments have built-in cupboards and so you had storage and things of that sort and there happened to be one in our bedroom which served as a dresser uh, and drawers and Jennifer who was three months old you see pictured with me with revolutionary when I mean in uh, urban wall suit carrying Jennifer who's three months at that time um, her bed was in the bottom drawer of <laughs> I mean, we were really revolutionary at the time and um, and we bought papers and stuff that were sort of like on the edge, you know, um, very political, very not the neighborhood paper. Um, we followed all kinds of of, um, of of publishing, you know, some reports that uh, were were interesting to us. But I was sort of on. I was sort of sort of really angst, uh, if that's the term. Um, with regard to um, our young people, our young men, and what the future was. And that was at my most angry edge, almost most angry. Um, but I, I thought they needed to gun up, you know, so that's where I'm saying. I'm talking about uh, you know, all the principles that you reach for. In, in life to, to make things peaceful for you and that you need to be whole. And at the same time, we both were in Florence. We were living in, we moved from Chicago uh, to Boston, but we stopped in Dominica for a few weeks. And we've been behaving at the time Father Seal of the campus files and, and there was heavy, heavy publicity, literature everywhere, posters. <coughs> so this influence was painted. Uh, you know, we were in Chicago when Fred Hampton got killed, but this didn't have hidden influence like the style did for this. And uh, you know, all the literature was read and there was a book, uh, a picture book of the Black Panther that I applied for Vanguard had a lot of images of it, and I got some of the images out of that book to put in. And, you know, this was, wasn't our hero, but we, we were impressed with the Black Panthers, with their mission. Oh, uh, were people able to hear that? <laughs> No. <laughs> and I think you also wanted to look at the last piece. Oh, this, this is the piece that was a tribute to apartheid. Um, to or to the struggle against apartheid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, he had introduced uh, tenfold gold for Uh, 
um, in, in teaching? Well, I worked in two private schools. Um, well, I should say this. Um, along with my children, I integrated two private schools. <laughs> so, let's go from there. <laughs> um, what I did was in posture, in um, values, uh, in attitude, I tried to bring something to those art students. Um, and our children were in, uh, the, in the first private school. One was in preschool, one was in middle, what they called middle school, but it was fourth grade, um, fourth through seventh. And our son was in the eighth grade when he went over. Um, so I would bring processes that might be shared in, um, in other cultures to familiarize them. Then when you back it up with incentive, some um, illustrations of work that has been done before or slides of other artists' work, that is how I would infuse some kind of appreciation for sculptural um, processes um, or you know drawings whatever but I used the the, um, the Im imagery that were that were available at museums and all to lend to schools the second school this that was a smaller school in Athens Georgia uh, when I got another appointment in um, and we moved to Atlanta, Georgia. That was a far larger school and far more progressive uh, about being accountable. You know, you know, Atlanta has a, had a black mayor, had, had, had several black mayors, but I think that was their first one at the time, and um, very, very conscious made the area. Um, and I might share this with you, too, because this was the home of Martin Luther King, and his children had thought of, I mean, the, the family wanted the children to integrate that school, or to be accepted in that school. And um, they were refused. And that was before the new headmaster who left the Athens School moved to Atlanta, a bigger area. A very marvelous man was being his headmaster. And they had this history of turning down the king children. And so I enrolled in a teacher kind of nationwide teacher conference of independent schools, and this is uh, people of color. Um, who are teaching in those schools and, and are administrators. And so my headmaster allowed me to enroll in that and travel to their conferences and bring back the word to our school, the Lubbock School. And um, at, at that point, I introduced something, a principle that they taught us to in, you know, with integrating these schools is to have a diversity awareness program. And so I became the the head of diversity awareness there, and then I could sort of cut, bring some stuff, in because it's with the idea that this is why I'm here, this is why we're familiarizing ourselves with um, other cultures. So. Your, your first exhibition uh, with Africa Cobra was in a school, if I'm not mistaken. Is that, yes. Yeah. Uh, upper grade. Upper grade. When I say upper grade, it was lower and upper grade. Central Hall, Wadsworth Upper Grade Center. 
<laughs> Pure, so purely I, coincidence. I, I, I really. the name that I yeah. heard last week. So. Yeah. Maybe one more question. Oh. <laughs> um, I mean, it's very interesting what you say about the you being revolutionaries uh, off wise, not like, you know, in the Black Panthers uh, sense. Um, yet, what is interesting is that the Black Lives Movement was referred to as the cultural wing of Black Power, the uh, aesthetic um, sister of uh, the Black Power movement. Could you tell us a bit more about this sort of transformation with that power, uh, the political side and the cultural side? How do they sort of compare each other? How do you compare, you know, what she did and what was done in the black power movement? Well, so the black power movement was Smith was very instrumental in this. This is the one with Stokely Carmichael and Rap Brown and several people like that. This this was. Uh, probably the beginning of the most resistant of the Black Power movement, because you know Dr. King's was nonviolent, and and at one point uh, people adopted sort of the uh, philosophy of that Malcolm X subscribed to, and the Panthers also subscribed to it. They were nonviolent themselves unless it was prompt. Um, so this is, and after Cobra sort of uh, subscribed to this kind of philosophy, uh, uh, not a nonviolent um, philosophy we subscribe to, and that's what we hope our work related to you know, the Black Power movement in that sense. If that made any sense to you. <laughs> well, your your images are so powerful that it's it's. I mean, it's hard not to think of black power when you <laughs> you see your 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 very powerful images. Um, so I think I think maybe we should um, close the discussion and move to reception. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here, and thanks again, Jay Wadsworth and Rebecca. Please join us upstairs for refreshments and to see the exhibition and uh, continue the discussion. Thank you.